Chapter 15 A little after five of the clock, Pooley and O'Malley left Professor Slocum's house behind and trudged up the long crescent bound for the swan. Although the old man had served a fine tea, neither could raise much of an appetite, finding to it more than a hint of the messianic feast. With rumbling guts and grumbling tongues, they mooched along, ignoring the gaily coloured bunting which fluttered between the great horse chestnuts, raised in preparation for the forthcoming festival of Brentford. Pooley was in full slouch, his chin upon his chest, and his hands thrust deeply into his tweedy trouser pockets. His last suit was in exquisite ruin and lacked a right sleeve, which an overzealous hospital intern, who watched too many old O'Ray films, had cut away from his grazed elbow with a pair of surgical scissors. The thought that he could buy a thousand suits and all of them of the hand-tailored Savile Row variety did little to raise his spirits. Jim's right thumbnail worried at his hidden palm. O'Malley worried at Marchant's pitted handlebars. The old boy seemed to have developed an irritating pull to the left, which was either something to do with its political leanings or something even more sinister. Give it a rest, growled John, as the thing had him in the gutter once more. After what seemed an age, they arrived at the swan's welcoming portal and found their increased horror that it was no longer welcoming. A large plastic sign fastened to the front window announced to the world that... The buying of rounds is henceforth forbidden by order of the brewery. Any customer attempting to violate this principle will be barred for an indefinite period. By the saints, said O'Malley, turning wobbly at the knees. Would you look at that? Pooley curled his lip. This is too much. I am even to be denied spending my money as I please. He thrust O'Malley aside and entered the bar. The swan was empty of customers. The only folk present were a pale young man in headphones who stood behind the jump and two brewery henchmen in drab-coloured overalls who appeared to be screwing a gleaming contrivance of advanced design onto the bar counter. What's the meaning of that notice? Pooley stormed up to the bar. The strange young barman watched his furious approach with an untroubled expression. His head moved to and fro to a rhythm only he heard. I demand an explanation, foamed the red-faced Jim. The young man pushed back his headphones. What will it be then, sir? he asked. Jim raised his fist. That, that damnable notice in the window. What's your game, eh? Oh, that. The young man was all bland composure. Rules and regulations. What can we do? We can tear it down for a kick-off. The young man waggled a finger. Noty, noty, said he. Jim clenched and unclenched his fists. Has the world gone mad? he asked. Has the brewery lost its marbles? The young man shrugged. Since takeover, everything seems to have changed. Takeover? What takeover? Haven't you heard? <laughs> Latinos and Romith bought the brewery out and offered too good to refuse, I suppose. Jim began to flap his hands wildly and spin about in small circles. O'Malley, who had followed him in, knew this to be a bad sign. Pooley sought men to kill. Two of such were now tinkering at the counter's end. Who are they? Jim ceased his foolish gyrations. What are they up to? The pale young man smiled wanly. Installing a terminal, of course, and a new system every establishment must have its own terminal, <laughs> you know. John, said Jim. John, hold me back. O'Malley did as he was bidden. What if one might be so bold? Is a terminal? he asked. My goodness me, the young man tittered to himself. We do live in the dark ages round here, don't we? <laughs> he grinned towards the two henchmen, who exchanged gnawing glances and sniggered. This terminal, he explained, is modular in concept, with a networking capability that is virtually plug-in. It has 128 million gigabyte multitasking operation, super advanced WP forms and spreadsheet planner, wide area network configuration, multi-key ISAM, one shared databases, L and R666 async emulation, software and bitmapped graphics. Bitmapped graphics, eh? The young man cleared his throat with a curiously mechanical coughing sound. <coughs> Bitmapped, he said slowly. Above his left eyebrow, the short row of eighteen vertical lines gave his face a permanently quizzical expression. Now, perhaps, sir, you would care to order? Two points are large, said O'Malley. As you wish, sir. Will your irate companion be thinking to order two for himself also, do you think, once he recovers his senses? We are only just outnumbered, quoth Pooley. 
Shall we make a fight of it? I'll in good time, Jim. Now please calm yourself and lend me a couple of quid. The peel barman raised a tattooed eyebrow. Usually is strictly forbidden from the premises by order of the brewery. I parks in the brewery, said John. Jim is mining some money for me. Can I have it back, please, Jim? Certainly. Pooley thrust a couple of hundred smacklers into O'Malley's outstretched palm and outstretched his arm towards the nearest pint. The new barman deftly reached across the countertop and caught up Jim's wrist in a vice-like grip. Turning Jim's palm towards the ceiling, he drew out a Latinos and Rummeth light wand and ran it across. Your credit right in his triple way, he said. Two pints for yourself, is it? Make it free, said Jim bitterly. I feel a bit of a first coming on. As you please, sir. The pale young barman replaced his headphones and, nodding to himself, drew off the business. Bearing away their pints, John and Jim stalked off to a side table where they dropped into a brace of chairs and sat staring into one another's eyes. After a somewhat pregnant pause, Jim said, I've had enough of all this, John. O'Malley nodded thoughtfully. It's not very much to my own liking, said he, gulping away the nearest pint. If you want my considered opinion, I feel that we should both do very well to have it away from this district post-haste. Look at those swine. Jim gestured towards the brewery henchmen, who were even now tearing up the swan's antique carpeting to run a power line across the floor. Ah, Rio would be your man, said John. Dusky maidens rolling green cigars upon their bronze thighs. A train robber chum of mine is lodging thereabouts. The climate, so they say, is ideal for the professional drinking man or the unemployed war criminal. Pooley considered his printed palm. I can't be having with all this stuff. Things are no longer healthier, Roberts. So let us away. Jim chewed upon a thumbnail. I think you're right, said he. But what about all this revelations business? Do you think that the professor is correct in his theories? If it is the end of the world, then it might catch up with us even in Rio. O'Malley downed another pint. I have my doubts about the whole thing. Listen, with the old current bond steaming down and a bottle or two of duty free on the patio table, we can give the matter serious thought. What do you say? I'll say it's time we had a holiday. Good man. Now travel agents in South Dealing calls us at six. I can be up there in five minutes on the bike and back in another five. I'll book us aboard an aeroplane for the first thing tomorrow. Do it then. Jim dragged out another bundle of banknotes and thrust them at John. Go at once. I'll get some bottles to take out. This place is beginning to depress me. Right then, I'll be back directly. O'Malley left the swan and mounted up Marchant, who had set himself in for an evening kip. He bumped down the curb and pedalled furiously up the road in the direction of South Ealing. Cresting the railway bridge, he swept down the other side, legs outspread, past the Morlands building. Without warning, he suddenly came into contact with a great body of halted traffic. The road was a shambles of stalled automobiles and shouting drivers. Cars were parked at crazy angles across the road, and those at the vanguard lay, their bonnets stove in and steam issuing from their shattered radiators. A blank wall of dark light rose from the street at the junction with the Great West Road. It soared into the sky, an impenetrable barrier blocking all further progress. O'Malley dragged on his brakes, but his iron stallion appeared to have developed ideas of its own. It rocketed him headlong into the boot of a stalled Morris Minor. John sailed forward in a blizzard of whirling banknotes to tumble down onto the bonnet of the defunct automobile and roll onto the roadway. Cursing and spitting, he slowly dragged himself to his feet and stared up at the grim barrier ahead, struck dumb with amazement and disbelief. The curtains, which the professor had observed so many weeks through his rooftop viewer, had finally closed upon the borders of the Brentford Triangle, and the parish was now completely sealed off from the outside world.